I'm here today to talk to you about consistency and concurrency control and transactions, okay? So first, a little bit about me. Like Sylvain said, I just graduated from MIT, and I used to work at Google. I worked on a couple different projects there, a, um, a blob storage system and a browser security application called Native Client. And my research is in how to execute fast transactions. So how do we do, uh, how do we get performance and consistency on multi-core and in distributed systems? First, I want to talk about this column that this guy writes. His name is James Mickens, and he used to be a researcher at Microsoft Research, but he's going to be starting as a professor at Harvard in the fall. And he writes this column, which is absolutely hilarious, for the Usenix login research publication. And there's one column in particular he wrote called The Night Watch. It's about a zombie apocalypse, and in it, he talks about who he would like to have with him when the zombie apocalypse comes. And so this is what he says, the most important person in my gang will be a systems programmer. A person who can debug a device driver or a distributed system is a person who can be trusted in a Hobbesian nightmare of breathtaking scope. A systems programmer has seen the terrors of the world and understood the intrinsic horror of existence. I love this quote. So um, what I want to say here is that we, we have a tool to address some of these problems, to address the Hobbesian nightmare and to deal with the intrinsic core of existence. And that tool is a consistency model. So consistency models help us reason about our code and avoid subtle bugs. And so in this talk, I'm gonna talk about that word consistency, what it means in three different contexts. So first there's consistency as the C in ACID with database transactions. There are consistency models, and there's many of them, some of them incomparable. And then I'm going to talk about exactly what that C means in the CAP theorem, which we've already heard about today. So let's start with the first one. So a transaction is something you issue your database, and what's going to happen is that it's going to execute the things between start and commit atomically. So it's going to do all of those SQL statements together at the same time. Uh, ACID stands for atomic, which means that uh, the whole thing happens or it doesn't happen. Consistent, and in this case, consistent is an application-defined notion of correctness. That's what the C in ACID means. So it means that, as an example, if you're a banking application and you've decided that account balances shouldn't go negative, then that's what consistent means, that your account balances don't go negative. There's isolation, which means that transactions don't interfere with each other and durability, which means the database can recover correctly from a crash. And a lot of very popular open source databases implement these semantics, for example, Postgres and MySQL. Now, when we think about what consistency really means in a database, we're usually talking about these top three things. And one form of strong consistency in a database with transactions is called serializability. So serializability is a property about a schedule of transactions. The result of executing a set of transactions is equivalent to executing those transactions one at a time in some serial order. Now, what this means is that the database and the return values from those transactions match some serial ordering. And this is a very standard definition for serializability. So what, what happens is if we have a database with serializability and each transaction is written correctly to preserve our bank balances, as an example, then at the end of a run of concurrent transactions, the database should still be in a correct state. Now, what's really nice here is that that means we can pretend that there's no concurrency happening. We can write our transactions as though they're executing one at a time uh, on a copy of the database. And a serializable database will take care of running these for us in parallel or concurrently, uh, but still get the right answer. Now, one thing I want to note here that's very important is that serializability does not mean serial execution. So we could execute our transactions on a database one at a time. If we had a multi-core database, that would be pretty slow. We would be wasting all of the cores except for one. Serial execution trivially gives us the property of serializability. The hard part is getting serializability while executing things concurrently. Now, in the literature, serial serializability is described as uh, schedules of transaction operations. And if a schedule is serializable, it means that it's illegal. It's equivalent to another schedule where the transactions ran one at a time. Now, let's look at an example to kind of see what this means. 
So here are two transactions. The first one is reading K and J and returning the results. So we have some key value store and we have some keys called K and J. And the second one, transaction two, is incrementing the values for K and J. Now, when we talk about a serializable execution, we're talking about how it looks like those transactions executed to the programmer. So if we have time on the right there, the way we want this to look is we want to return uh, of that, the values of K and J as though it happened at one point in time, in particular the same point in time. And the same thing with the increment. And so to the programmer, if we started with K equals zero and J equals zero, then one valid execution would be transaction one executing before transaction two, in which case it would return zeros for both values. But another valid execution is if transaction two executes before transaction one. And that means that transaction one would return two ones because we're incrementing both K and J. So why do we care about this? Well, here I'm showing you what's happening inside the transaction. So let's say transaction one and transaction two are, for example, executing on two different cores at the same time. They're happening in parallel. And this is how we get good performance out of our databases. We execute transactions in parallel. Now, even though the transaction operations are being interleaved here, we see that we're still getting one of the correct outcomes for the execution of the transactions. Even though they're executing kind of on top of each other, it looks like transaction one happened after transaction two. Now, here's an example of an incorrect interleaving of the transactions. So what's happening here is that the add to K is happening, then we're doing both reads, and then the add to J is happening. And so what happens is that transaction one is returning one and zero, because that's what it sees. So this is an incorrect execution. This is not serializable. So that was a very simple example of two transactions that just incremented a couple keys and read them. But with a more complex application and more complex application logic, reasoning about transaction interleavings can be really, really difficult, or in particular, reasoning about the interleavings of the operations within the transactions. So the nice thing about using a database with serializability is that you don't have to reason about those interleavings. If you put something in the same transaction, it will execute atomically. Another nice benefit of serializability is that we're expressing our invariance in one place, the transaction code. So we don't have to write extra code to make sure that we clean up sort of things that are laying around. Uh, we make sure that every user is part of a group. We don't have to like run these batch scripts and write these things to fix up our data. We've just expressed it in the transaction. And when you run with serializable semantics, then the integrity of your application is preserved. OK, so that's ACID. Now let's talk about um, consistency models. So there's a lot of different types of consistency models. And what these are all talking about is if you take a schedule of reads and writes, so just reads and writes, we're not talking about transactions anymore, uh, then what kinds of orderings and return values from those reads and writes um, are legal? So first of all, we can talk about eventual consistency. So this model allows a lot of interleavings of reads and writes. And so what happened in, was in 2006, Google published the Bigtable paper. And in 2007, Amazon published the Dynamo paper. And these two papers kind of kicked off this big NoSQL movement. And so there's been a lot of open source um, NoSQL systems which run with eventual consistency. And so let's delve into exactly what that means. These systems have a lot of benefits. They're very scalable. They're fault tolerant. But, uh, but let's talk about what eventual consistency really gets us here. So here's the definition. The definition of eventual consistency is, if no new updates are made to a key, eventually all accesses will return the last updated value. But you know, if we're running in a distributed system, time is kind of a fuzzy concept. So it's not really clear what the last updated value is. So really what this means is it'll eventually return some value that kind of seems like it could have been the last. And when, this is the thing that's always bugged me about the eventual consistency definition, when do you stop writing to your system? When do you get this like magic vacation time when nothing's actually happening and you can allow everything to, to coalesce? So on the other end of the spectrum is strict consistency. This is also known as linearizability. 
Uh, and what this means is that the reads and writes appear to have executed in a total order that matches time. So this is very easy to think about, to reason about, to understand. It's just like you're running your code on a single processor. So here's a list of a few different consistency models, uh, strict consistency at the top and eventual consistency at the bottom. The most common ones that I've seen in most systems are the top two and the bottom two. There are many other consistency models and some of them are incomparable. You can't even say one is stronger or weaker than the other. Okay, so now we'll go back to what is apparently a very popular topic today, the CAP theorem. So uh, the CAP theorem stands for consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Now the C here, the consistency here, means linearizability. We're talking about strong consistency. And what, this, what the CAP theorem really embodies is how you might have to make trade-offs. So when you're running your distributed system where things can fail, you have to make trade-offs between uh, whether or not you can process reads and writes and whether or not you're gonna get the correct answer. So this theorem was first proposed by Eric Brewer in 2000 at a talk at PodC, a conference. And uh, it turns out that it's actually a rephrasing of a much older result, the FLP result, which stands for Fisher, Lynch, and Patterson, uh, which is called the impossibility of distributed consensus with one faulty process. And so what this paper is really saying is that uh, even when you're only allowing at most one process to fail, you can get yourself into a situation where you can never reach consensus. That somebody will fail at exactly the wrong time, right as you're about to reach consensus, over and over and over again, and your system will just never get there. So it's an impossibility result. It's, it's not saying that uh, you can never reach consensus. It's saying that you can't reach consensus under all conditions. It doesn't mean that this is gonna happen frequently, you, if your network is extremely reliable and your machines aren't failing, then you might never, ever, ever see this problem. So when we're talking about that impossibility result, we really need to think about it in context. What does it mean? Does it mean that we just can't have correctness in our systems, that we just we have to throw up our hands and give up? Is it impossible to run a correct distributed database because of this uh, impossibility result? Well, here's an analogy I really like to use. So have you guys played Candy Crush, the game where you have to match things? Uh, so this category of games is actually NP hard. And to remind you, NP means that, if a problem is NP, it means that it can't run in polynomial time. And we very much rely on problems that can't run in polynomial time being hard. All of cryptography depends on this. Yet, we can play Candy Crush. We can play it, we can enjoy it, we can often beat it, actually, for a large subset of the games. So when we apply this analogy to the cap theorem, the way I think about it is that it's true, it's impossible to 100% of the time make progress and get the right answer if you can't rely on synchronous messaging, which is one of the things that that paper uh, assumes, no synchronous messaging. However, you can 100% of the time make progress and get the right answer if partitions heal. And what that means is that we know the upper bound on message delays. So if we're operating in a synchronous network where we actually know for sure that messages are never gonna take longer than some amount of time, and this is not a realistic scenario, there are definitely situations where we don't actually know the upper bound on how long a message can take. But if we were operating in that world, then we could always make progress and get the right answer. However, the system would probably be extremely slow. And so that's why I think the question we really want to address is this one. Uh, how can we get strong consistency and good performance? What about the common case? What about your average operation? Not these crazy points in time when there's a partition that's a bit longer than however long you assume the maximum of a partition could be. But for every message, your average message, how do we get strong consistency um, and performance without too much blocking? Because consistency requires a certain amount of communication and blocking. So how do we reduce these costs while still producing a correct ordering of reads and writes and handling failures. And that's what some, I've tried to do with some of my research. And there's a lot of research out there that has tried to focus on getting correct, strong results with good performance. So I really like this quote. Uh, it's from the Spanner paper, which is a giant global distributed database from Google. 
We believe it is better to have application programmers deal with performance problems due to overuse of transactions as bottlenecks arise, rather than always coding around the lack of transactions. And so this paper is very interesting because remember, uh, Google was one of the companies that sort of kicked off this whole NoSQL movement. And so it's very interesting that they came around full circle. They decided that actually it was just too hard to program with this model. And really what you should do is not prematurely optimize. Start out with strong consistency and then see what you can do about the bottlenecks as they actually come up. So, this is what I talked about in this talk, consistency as in ACID database transactions, consistency models, which have to do with schedules of reads and writes, and a little bit about the CAP theorem, which is about the trade-offs you have to make when you're working in a distributed system where servers can fail. I wanna leave you with these takeaways. So the first one is that you should always use well-tested, long-lived databases hopefully with serializable isolation semantics, until you have a performance problem. So don't prematurely optimize. Start with something that's easy to understand and see if it works for you, if its performance is okay. The second thing is to be aware of what is changing when you move between systems with different consistency models. They're all kind of subtly different and they can result in slightly different schedules. And so if you're gonna change around which system you're using, it's important to know how its consistency model is different than the previous one. And then finally, consciously decide what trade-offs to make. Decide that you're willing to give up some correctness for performance or decide that you're not but don't let the systems you're using just make that decision for you without understanding what's going on. All right, so that's it. Thank you very much. This is my contact information.